Does it say who? Elders has Lonnie. an announcement. Lonnie does. Yep. Mr. Lonnie. Good morning. Good morning, ladies. Good morning. Ball popped up. The sun. Oh, <laughs> it's been a long since we've seen it. That's, that's, the that's truth a right UFO there. right there. You know? That is the truth. I right? began to wonder if we'd ever see it again there for a while. Me too. Consider some something about heavenly sunlight today. That's yeah, there you go. Evelyn, let me see this a minute. Got it this month. Right. I just I didn't even say I didn't know I, I was on it. Bulletin. I just okay. checked the bulletin. Well, anyway, both of us aren't going to be there. Yeah, I didn't well, know. You texted me. Way. I thought you were on it. Somebody else. Uh, uh, I don't know. You. We get somebody. Let's go flying, buddy. I'll get. Uh, yeah. I'll be. 
Good morning, everyone. 
Good to see all these smiling faces out here. Seemed like a pretty day, and we're all glad to be out. So it's good to see everyone. It's a great day to assemble and worship our God. And a uh, <clears throat> wonderful day to gather together and uh, meet with our Christian friends. So we're looking forward to our time of worship today. We'd like to welcome those who might be visiting with us today. If you're traveling or if you're here visiting with friends or family, we welcome you. If you are from the Benton community, we hope you will give us an opportunity to get to know you. At this time, if you would, everyone please take out an attendance card from the rack in front of you. And the red side would be for the visitors and pass those to the aisle. They will be taken up shortly. Also, we would like to welcome those who are watching on the World Wide Web by live stream, and we would like to welcome those who are listening by WITB radio. For our visitors, we have a nursery available. It's out the foyer and down the hall to the left, and we will have Bible classes for all ages. If you are visiting one again, uh, please give us opportunity to direct you to a Bible class and to have your children attend Bible classes. Uh, we hope everyone will stay and enjoy one of those classes. We're glad you're here today. Before Scott continues to lead our singing, I would like to read a passage from Psalms 46, verses 10 and 11. As the Lord spoke to the psalmist, he said, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Scott.
Would you bow with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. As we look around, Father, we see the renewing of nature and, and your handiwork in all, in all areas. Father, we come especially to thank you this morning for this congregation that meets here. We thank you for the many aspects and areas that we work in. We thank you for the congregation itself, Father, for the diversity of it, for the energy of our youth, for the knowledge of those that are older. We pray that as all these groups work together, we can always continue to strengthen ourselves and strengthen your word here in our community. Most especially thankful, Father, for your sending your son to be an example for us, to leave us the, the word that he has, to all the examples that he has. We pray, Father, that we can take these, we can always use them to pay it forward to, to the next generation, Father. <clears throat> we have several, Father, in our midst that are sick. We ask that you be with them, be with those that are working with them, and we pray that be your will, Father, you might soon re return them to us. <coughs> Continue to be with us, Father, as we go on into this service. We pray that all things we do will be acceptable in thy sight. Forgive us when we fall short. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to be reading from Romans chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, maybe turn with me there. Romans chapter 5 will tell us about how much God loves us. And when we read this passage, I want us to be thinking about um, how much forethought God had in mind for us. Long ago, God had a plan for us, for us um, sinners and the weak people. Beginning in verse 6, it says, For although while we were still sinners at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone might dare even to die. But God demonstrated his own love toward us, in that, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. So that tells us that we're justified and that we're going to escape God's wrath. So let's keep reading. For if, uh, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So it tells us that we're reconciled when we are saved by, by the life that Christ uh, gave up for us. And, and we'll keep going with one more verse here. Not only this, but we also exalt God through our Lord Jesus Christ, whom we have now received the reconciliation. 
See, Jesus played an important role between us and God. God is our creator. We separated ourselves from God because of our sin. And the role of Christ is to forgive us of our sins. He came and he offered, he fulfilled the law of the Old Testament. In doing so, he brought about a new kingdom. And one of the uh, symbols of that is this, uh, this meal that God instituted or Jesus instituted before his death. That when we come here, we're supposed to remember the life that he was about to give us. And when now he obviously has. But it's to show that God had a plan for us. And that plan was to justify us. And to reconcile us back to that original relationship that humans had with God in the garden. And not only that, we have a lot more blessings. And we have a, a hope of eternal home with that. I don't know about you guys, but fact that we do this weekly is a good reminder that that it's for a purpose and that we can buy into God's love because we can believe it because God uh, does love us and this weekly reminder of, of of the bread and the juice of Jesus dying on the cross a representation of his blood and his body that was broken that's uh, pretty powerful as we partake of this uh, this this feast here we remember the, the, the sinful life that we have and how we are forgiven and how we are redeemed because of it. I don't know about you guys, but that says a lot about our God who is willing to forgive us and who's willing to love us enough to send his own son to do that for us. So let's, uh, let's come up here and we'll have our prayer. God, we know that you are very rich in mercy, but most importantly father i think that you're selfish unselfish that you would send your um, your son here to uh, die on the cross for our sins and you recognize that love father and we say thank you we thank you for the justification and the redemption and the reconciliation that we have through your son and god we do ask for forgiveness we're proud at times and we're and we do have sin, Father. And we ask for forgiveness. And Father, we just say thank you that we can uh, come here and that you would be with us, Father. And Lord, we just want to declare you God and, we, and the creator of all things. And we, and we just again thank you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
Let's bow again. Father, thank you. Thank you for your son and the promises that we have through him, Father. It motivates us and it keeps us going, Father. We do love you. and We know that you love us, Father. And as we take of this uh, fruit of the vine, Father, and we rem uh, remember the blood that was shed. And we know that it's also the same blood that uh, cleanses us, Father. And help us to be more motivated to follow you and, and to seek after you and be more like you, Father, because of it. And again, we just say thank you. And we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Another act of worship that I guess we get to do here right now is to give back to what is uh, already God's. It's our um, responsibility and I would say a discipline to um, set aside some money each week of our earnings and the things that we've, um, our hands have, have worked and the money that we have made to give back to the, the ministry of the church or for the ministry of the church. Um, so let's... Um, Let's have a cheerful heart this morning and, and give back. If you will, pray with me. God, we, knew, we know that all things flow through you, Father. Um, you created the heavens and the earth, and, and all things on this earth are yours, Father. And we thank you, and we pray that we can be good stewards of it, Father. And we thank you for that responsibility, and we pray that we live up to it. God, help us to be disciplined, and help us to... Um, Seek after the good things in this, on this earth. We pray for the ministry of the church here and the contribution that is given and all the things that we can uh, accomplish through you, Father. And we know that um, you, will, um, you will bless us in those efforts. And we do ask you um, to help us in those. And we just again thank you for the, um, I guess, the wealth that we have and the jobs that we have, Father. Just again, pray this prayer in Jesus' name, and amen.
scripture reading this morning will come from John chapter 3, verses 27 through 30. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. You may be seated. Good morning. It is good to see everybody today. We're glad that you're here. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles over there to John chapter 3. Look at verse 21 through 31 eventually as we go through there. But I want us to look at the life of John. As we begin, I want to thank everybody for being here. Thank you for the opportunity to worship with you and for us to be together and to share warm fellowship. I was telling somebody earlier, this is a great time of year. We have spring weather without the allergies. The allergies have not yet come, at least for me. So that makes it a good time of year for all of us to be together. I also want to thank Scott uh, for the uh, song selection today. What we're going to talk about today is service, is humility, is giving ourselves up for one another and primarily for God. And we're going to focus there on chapter 3 and verse 30 where John the baptizer, as he's talking about his life and his ministry and his purpose, says a phrase that each one of us could repeat. He, that is Jesus, must become greater, and I must become less. He must become greater, and I must become less. Now that's a hard attitude for us to have, and especially for us to maintain. Because we live in a world where everybody wants folks to notice us. And we will live in a world where everybody wants to be appreciated and to be liked. And we want what we want. We want our lifestyle. We want our uh, reputation. And oftentimes that crosses against Christianity. And so as we begin our lesson, let's go ahead and do a quick review of who John the Baptist or John the Baptizer is. Sometimes I call him the Baptizer because he's not a member of the Baptist denomination. He's called Baptist because of his practice of immersing people. So who was this John the Baptist that we read of in Scripture? I remember many years ago when I was at Freed Hardeman, one of our teachers, uh, Dr. Dow Flatt was his name. He, uh, in our class on John, said, the very first class, he said, I want everybody to go home and write out a sermon on John the Baptist. He says he's one of the key figures of all scripture and nobody ever preaches on him. So you go home and put together a sermon and that way you can be the one preacher in the world who preaches on John the Baptist. Well, I thought that was funny at the time. I put it together. But, you know, looking over this career and such, you see, we don't really talk about him all that much. He's a very neat guy, but he's not really emphasized very much in our preaching and teaching today. So who is John the Baptist? Who is John the Baptizer? Well, when we begin reading about him in Luke chapter 1, we see his birth. He had two parents, which I guess all of us do, don't we? You have uh, Elizabeth and Zacharias. Zacharias was a priest at the time, and as you look at the time in which he was being born, you can kind of begin seeing really when the birth of Jesus is. You find the date of the birth of Jesus a lot easier in Luke 1 than you do anywhere else, because John is born three months before Jesus would be born. But as you look at Luke and, or at Zacharias and Elizabeth, you see that they're having difficulty having a child. You see where by a miracle, Elizabeth is now with child. And you see where it's just amazing to hear about what John the Baptist's life is prophesied to become. It's fascinating stuff. And then later we run across him in Scripture. And as we're looking at him in Scripture, we see his work. As he begins preaching in Matthew chapter 3 and other passages as well. And his sermon is, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And he begins preaching to the soldiers. And he says, do your job well. Don't steal money from anybody. Don't coerce people. He tells the Pharisees that they're a brood of vipers, a bunch of snakes. And that they need to be warned of the coming wrath 
And he goes through and he's a very strong, hard preacher. And as he preaches these things, people are attracted to him. Even though he's out in the wilderness, even though he's out in the uh, desert. Because he wears rough clothes, he wears camel skin, and he eats wild locusts and wild honey. And so that's one of the things we oftentimes think of when we think of John is the rough lifestyle that he would live as he lived off the land rather than living in the city. And as we begin and continue along, we see his preaching and how he preached to the people and would bring them up back to God preparing for the Messiah. And then later in his life, we see about the time when Jesus is around the age of 30. John the baptizer now is not as popular as he was before. And we see where, because of his preaching against many of the rulers of the day, he is thrown in prison because he's preaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And so he's thrown into prison, and we see where eventually his head will be cut off because of the depravity of a wife and her daughter. But as we look at John, and I want us to kind of go back and review this real quick, you see that John had a purpose. He's the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the paths, or make easier the paths, for the Messiah is coming. And everything about John points to Jesus. We go back to his birth, and as you look there in Luke 1, 41, even while Jesus is, or even while we have Jesus is in the womb and John's in the womb, when the two mothers meet together, Mary and Elizabeth were cousins, when they meet with one another, the babe, John, leaps in Elizabeth's womb at the fact that he is now in the presence of the Messiah. So even before they were born, John's excited about being around Jesus. And as we continue along looking at that work, notice what it is that John's doing. He is bringing the people to repentance to recognize and to be ready for the coming of Jesus. When we look at his preaching, he says, I am not the one who is the Messiah, but I am speaking or the forerunner of one who is to come. And when Jesus appears, he says to Jesus, I'm not even worthy to tie your shoes, Jesus. I'm not worthy to baptize you. But he does baptize Jesus and initiates his work in the kingdom and initiates the work in which Jesus is going to have during his earthly ministry. And even at the death of John, when he knows he's about to die, notice what he does. We see here in Luke chapter 7 and verse 20, he sends some of his disciples to go to Jesus and ask some questions. Oftentimes, folks who study scripture closely will say, well, maybe John was full of doubt at this time. And maybe now he was in prison, he was upset and really didn't know if what he had done was right or not. What did these people ask? They came up to ask Jesus, are you really the Messiah or is there someone else who is coming? Why would, why would John send his disciples to talk to Jesus? Because John recognized his ministry was about to end and he wanted his disciples to meet the Messiah and begin to follow him. And as we read in John 1, we see many of the apostles of Jesus actually began as apostles of John or disciples of John. And so as we read here in John chapter 3 in the text which we're looking at today, we see at this point near the end of the ministry of John, some of John's disciples are upset. And the reason they're upset is they say, well, John, our rabbi, the man that we love and adore, John, some of our disciples and a lot of the people are beginning to follow Jesus over here. We've got to do something with our ministry. We've got to liven something up somehow because our people are beginning to leave and we're losing popularity and we're losing the people who love us. And what does John say to that? He must increase and I must decrease. And that's the focus of our lesson today. He must increase and I must decrease. And so let's look at that for a little bit as we begin to look at our next slide here. And as you look here, we see where he masters himself. He says, I must become less. And he begins talking through this passage about how he needs to learn to give himself up for God. The desire for recognition is absolutely universal. We all want to win awards. We all want to win a prize. We all want to be important. And that's not just true today, but actually it's always been true. 
We go back in the very beginning of Scripture and we see Cain and Abel. And we see where Cain is upset because Abel's sacrifice is accepted and Cain's isn't. And Cain allows that to grind in him and to sour in him to the point to where finally he goes and he kills his brother. We begin looking just a few chapters later, Genesis chapter 11 and verse 4. And we see as the people have just recovered from the ark and they've just recovered from that worldwide flood, they begin to get together and notice what they say. You know, let us make a house. Let us make a tower and it's going to put us all the way up on God's level. And instead of spreading out and filling the world and instead of following God's plan, they decide, let's figure out a way to make us better. Let's figure out a way to make us be equal with God. Kind of hear that today too, don't we? But you see, we see a recognition here. God begins to scatter the people. And he takes away some of their blessings. He takes away some of their opportunities because they refuse to follow God and because they're filled with pride. That's foreshadowing. We're coming to that later in the lesson. And so you see that even though there's that universal recognition in Genesis chapter 11, God tells us he must be greater and we must become less. We look over at one of the great kings in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 30. You see a man named Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar has the hanging gardens of Babylon. He has the largest empire known to that day and maybe the grandest of the empires that's ever existed. And even though he's been warned not to in a dream, even though his close servant, uh, Daniel, has told him not to, one day he looks around at everything he has, and he sees how great he is. And he lifts himself up before God, and he says, Everybody, look at how great I am. And when God sees it, he takes away what Nebuchadnezzar has. And he makes Nebuchadnezzar crawl on the ground like a madman and eat grass. And he causes his hair and his nails to grow so that he looks like a bird. And he spends years in insanity until he finally recognizes that God is greater than he is. That God must become greater and he must become less. In the New Testament, we see in Luke chapter 12, the parable of the great fool. Here was a man who was doing great in business and was well known. And as he brings everything in, he says, wow, I need bigger barns. I need a bigger place to put all my stuff. Sounds like us today sometimes, right? We keep putting more stuff and more stuff and getting more storerooms and more storerooms. Well, that's what this man says. He says, look how great I am. Look at all the stuff I have. And Jesus says that night, the Lord came to him and said, your soul is required of you. Whose will all these things of yours become? And sadly, everything that was important to this man was suddenly gone. You see, it's a universal thing which not only exists in me and you, but it's existed throughout the ages. This idea of pride and this idea of lifting ourselves up and we want to be on God's level and tell God how it is. And we want everybody else to look at us and see how great we are. It's a universal thing which so often happens. But it's what gets us in trouble. It's a danger even in the church. In Matthew 20 and verse 26, we read in this passage where Jesus says, whoever desires to be great in the kingdom, if you want to be great in the church, Jesus says, you must first learn how to be a servant. Those who are great in the kingdom are those who serve one another. Those who make themselves powerful in God's eyes are the ones who quietly serve behind the scenes. The ones who quietly give their lives up for God. The ones who put Him first and foremost in everything that they do. In God's how-to daily application of Christian living chapter, that's Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, it says, In honor, give preference one to another. Now, sometimes I like different translations, sometimes not so much, especially when they go against uh, literal translation. But I like some of the more uh, interpretive translations of Romans 12.10. Because some of them will say, in preference, try to outserve one another. Or in a competition, try to serve other people more than they can serve you. And it's like Paul is saying, listen, in the church, we all need to have a competition. Who can serve one another more and who can lift up one another even more than everybody else? Now, we're not really supposed to be in a competition because then maybe you would have pride in that you were serving too much, or whatever else it may be. But that's a little bit of what Paul's saying. And it's a danger, danger, danger in the church 
when I lift myself up and I want everybody to see how great I am. And it's a danger in a church when you and I uh, feel the temptation to show off to everybody. To say, I'm a leader in this church, and I am great in this church. and Man, I've done so much in this church. And when we begin to get that attitude, when we begin to get that mindset, then we are in trouble. Because then Satan has us where he wants us. He has you religious so that your conscience is all right. But he has you in a place where sometimes you can cause trouble. And sometimes you can get into trouble. You see... He mastered himself in saying, I must become less. But then he also began to look after Jesus. Jesus must be greater, and I must become less. The great theologian, Phil Robertson, maybe you remember him, Duck Dynasty. One of the sayings he always would say is, there is a God, and I am not him. Now, Looking at that quote, trying to figure out where Phil got it, I'm not sure. I've seen it go all the way back to the 1920s. I don't really see it coming from a great theologian necessarily, but it's a saying that every one of us needs to remember. There is a God, and I am not Him. Jesus must be in charge of my life. And Jesus must also be in charge of your life. When John saw Jesus, he saw that there was something special. Maybe it was because of miracles. Maybe it was because of signs. Maybe it was because of what his parents had told him. Maybe it's because they were cousins. Can you imagine playing with Jesus every day? That'd be kind of interesting, wouldn't it? But when he saw Jesus, he knew that there was something special. And he recognized that his life, the work of his life, was to reflect Jesus. Was to show people to the Messiah was to be less so that he could be greater. And it was something which he held to all the time. He recognized that greatness belongs to God. In Acts chapter 10, looking there in verse 26, we see Cornelius, the first Gentile who was preached the gospel to. And as he's beginning to hear the gospel, and as he sees Peter, who's one of the pillars of the church, he falls down at Peter's feet and he begins to worship And what does this one of the leading apostles say? He looks at Cornelius and he says, What are you doing? Don't worship me. I'm just a person. I'm just a man, just like you. None of us are any different. Now, look in your religious life. Who is it that you worship? Who is it that you listen to? Who is it that controls you? Now, it's good for us to have influence. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul says, follow me even as I follow Christ. It's important for us. Paul talks to Timothy about how Paul is his father in the faith. It's good if you have Christian parents to follow their example. It's good if you really respect a Christian teacher to want to be like him or her, to want to be like them. But truly, to whom does your allegiance lie? It must be God. And every day and every decision that you make... God must be greater, and you must be less. You must be mastered by Jesus, and you must make the decision to always follow Him in everything that you do. In Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 7, one of the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. Let's go ahead and look at our passage. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles, if you will, or electronic devices. Look at John chapter 3, 21 through 31. I I realize we read this just a few minutes ago. Jason read it for us. But I want us to read through it one more time before we get to the application part of our lesson. John chapter 3, 21 through 31. Looking here, we see uh, John talking, and notice what he says. Just a second, let me make sure I found it. Let's start in verse 26, John chapter 3. And they came to John, this is New King James I'm reading from, and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. And John answers and says, A man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I've said, I am not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. 
He who has seen the bride is a bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. Now, we've all been to weddings, right? We've all been to weddings and we've seen all the stuff that's happened. Probably the majority of us here have been in weddings, right? And I always like the night before the wedding when everybody's practicing. You're like, oh, who walks in on this song and who says this at this point and everything else. But if you recall a wedding and maybe your wedding happened in this building, you recall that, you know, the guys, there's always masking tape on the floor where the guys are because guys just stand, you know, they're just there. But then all the bridesmaids will come in and, you know, they all have dresses that, you know, maybe match, maybe don't match, but their dresses will probably never, ever wear again. But they all come in and they match the curtains or the flowers or whatever else it may be. Now, the bride looks different, right? Bride, she taking notes here? All right. All right. The bride looks different than everybody else. And so as they walk in, the bride comes in, everybody stands up and rises. And they all say, look how great she looks. Now imagine if the bridesmaid was up here and she was in a dress that looked just like the bride. Imagine if she was better looking than the bride was. And imagine if the whole wedding, everybody, instead of looking at the bride, was like, well, yeah, she's getting married, but man, look at that bridesmaid over there, that maid of honor. The wedding would not be fulfilling its purpose, would it? It wouldn't be working at all because the purpose of a wedding is not only to join those two, but it's to show how special those two are. And the people who are the bridesmaids and the bridegrooms are not there to attract attention to themselves. They are there to show support and love and to show off the bride and the groom. Right? John says, that's what my Christianity is like. When I am in the church and everybody focuses on me, when people think, man, Benton Church of Christ, I'm thinking of a certain person who goes there. When we put the focus on us, then we've forgotten the entire point. Because the church is the bride of Christ. And my job and your job as Christians, my job and your job as members of this church is to point to Jesus and to be here for support, to be here for love, but to say Jesus is who I care about and Jesus is what's important and Jesus is what really matters. That's the point that's there. And so John the Baptizer says that and then he backs it up with verse 30 where he says he must be greater and I always must be less. Very important. Well, let's go to the application of this sermon. Jesus must be greater than my religious views. You see, there's no other name given among heaven by which we must be saved than Jesus Christ. You're not saved by the gospel of Mark Ray. You're not saved by the gospel of your pastor or your parents or your church. It is Jesus who saves. And so when I look at my doctrine, when I look at my church, when I look at my beliefs, it cannot be centered in the American Restoration Movement. It cannot be centered in the creeds and the synods of times have gone past. My gospel, my religion must be the same as what saved John and Paul and Matthew and the apostles of the first century. Because it's about Jesus, and it's not about me. You see, each day I must transform my life rather than being conformed to this world. And I must put God first in everything that I do. My religion, my faith must be centered in Jesus Christ. Number two, in my daily life, Every aspect of me must be given to God. So you look at these passages, you see where our every thought needs to be held captive by Christ. Now imagine what it is going through your mind. Maybe sometimes you have good things, but maybe sometimes some things not so good. Jealousy, passions, uh, lust, um, anger, whatever it may be. 
The way in which Paul tries to write this by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is he says, listen, you have trained your animal. You have trained yourself to be exactly what God wants it to be. Have you ever seen someone who has really trained a puppy dog or really trained an animal to where they can lay food on the ground, but that dog will not eat until you give them permission to eat? Have you ever seen someone train an animal to where they will always remain in a certain area because they know better than to leave, because they trust their master or they fear their master? That's what Paul's talking about when he says, my every thought is under the control of Christ. He tells Timothy, or he tells the Thessalonians, that they are to hold their bodies in sanctification and honor. They are to recognize their bodies as the Holy Spirit, and because of that, there are some things they will not do, some things they will not live. You must put God first in your every thought and your every motive. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to Him, giving honor to Him, and everything that you do. And now this third point. And, you know, reading that, it may look kind of unusual. And let me explain what I mean. Because I probably, well, you probably don't have idols around the house. You probably don't have a big gold statue or a silver statue or wood or whatever that you bow down to. But we've got idols. And what is an idol? It's everything that takes you away from God. Or it's everything that can distract you from God. And this will be a little bit off topic, but I think it's close enough to this sermon to where we can put it together. Okay? Imagine with me today that you're on good terms with God. And because of that, he has said yes to your prayers. Right? He says yes to whatever you pray for. God, I want a new car. There it is. God, I want a bigger house. There it is. God, I want a family that has no problems. There it is. God, I need a whole lot of extra money to pay for this house, car, and family that has no problems. There you go. Imagine if God has blessed you with everything that you have. Well, he has, but everything that you wanted. Would you at that point be closer to God or further away? If you had no problems in life, If you had no difficulties, would you be closer to God or further away? Let me tell you a temptation that happens sometimes. When I go through life and I don't have problems, sometimes I begin to trust in myself quite a bit. And maybe I find myself like those people at the Tower of Babel. Maybe I find myself like the um, king of Babylon. Look at this kingdom I've created and look at the good things which I've done. There are some times where the good things of our life become idols. And while God has given them because he loves us, we allow them to replace God or at least distract us from God. Now, let me also go in a different thought process here. Okay? And this other thought process is many times as Christians, we don't understand why God does stuff the way he does it. Why is there cancer? Why are some people just bad? Why is there divorce? Why is there failure? Why are there car wrecks? Why do people we love grow old and die? You and I, in our finite minds, we don't understand what God is doing and Sometimes we're like, God, you're not doing this the right way. God, this is not good at all. Take a step back. When you lose what's precious to you, maybe family, maybe job, maybe money, maybe health, when you endure those problems that are there, do you get closer to God or do you get further away? As a preacher, one of the cool things about the job is not just the preaching. Preaching is like 25% of this whole job. One of the neat things is you get to be around people at happy times. Weddings, uh, when babies are born, when people are baptized, it's an awesome job that's there. 
But another aspect of preaching is you get to be around people when they're struggling. Get to go see people when they're sick. See people when they've had a bad diagnosis. See people when, they're, uh, when things are not going the way they're supposed to. Sometimes you get to hold people's hands as they fade away and as they die. You know, when someone is dying, a lot of times the style of car that they drive is not really very important. And sometimes their house and how big that house is and how impressive is not really important. And oftentimes their job title, their occupation, and their reputation really isn't all that important. In the cemetery, their tombstone may be a little bigger, but the plot's still the same size. And sometimes as we near the end of our life, God takes away some of those idols because he wants to make sure that we have him first. And he's giving us opportunity. He's giving us a chance to realize we need to depend on him and not on ourselves. Think about that aspect and think about how God works in that way. Whether you look at this county and what happened last month, whether you look around in your family and you see the issues going on, those issues either drive you further away from God or they make you realize that you trust in him and he is the solution And the things of this world aren't the solution. John was nearing the end of his ministry. And as he's talking to his disciples who are so worried about reputation and so worried about perhaps their income and so worried about how their master is being treated, John saw the point. And the point is this. God must be greater and I must become less. And so as we wrap the sermon up, That's the question that we all have to ask ourselves. When you look at your life, wherever you may be, some of us are young, some of us are, oh, you can't call people old, not so young. Wherever you are in life, can you say, in my life, God is becoming greater and I'm becoming less? Do you have the same attitude that John has? Let me tell you a secret. If you don't have it yet, God will make sure eventually you do have it. Where is your faith? Is God the central point of your life? Or are you caught up with these little idols that distract? Have you given yourself fully to the master? Or are you being led astray by this world? This morning, if you need to become a Christian, if you need the prayers of the saints... We invite you to come forward as we stand and as we sing.
like to mention those who we need to remember in prayer. Camden Phillips, doing well, back with us today. We're so happy to see her. Thankful that everything went well. Cecil Spiceland uh, had surgery last Friday, and I understand Don tells me that he is doing well, has some movement in his hands and arms now, and uh, hopefully he'll be out of the hospital maybe by Tuesday. Room 599 in Lourdes. Darren Nelson, a 20-year-old friend of Philip Rudd, has numerous health issues, and he is requesting our prayers. And Teresa Anderson handed me this note that um, her sister-in-law, Marie Cabot, had a heart attack Tuesday morning. And she is at Lourdes in room 705. So we want to remember her. And her aunt, Jane Bloomingberg, fell Friday and broke her wrist and hip. And she is also at Lourdes. So we need to re certainly remember that family. If you would, let's go to our Father in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the opportunity that you have given us today to gather to worship you. We praise you, Lord. We're thankful for your greatness. We're thankful for your power and for your love for us. And we're thankful for Jesus and for his death on the cross that we might have eternal life. Father, we are thankful for this congregation. And we pray, Father, that you will bless each and every member of this congregation. Help us to do your will. Help us to grow in faith, love toward you and toward each other daily. We pray, Father, for those who have mentioned as being sick, for Camden Phillips, Cecil Spiceland, Darren Nelson, Marie Cabot, and Jane Bloomingberg. We pray, Father, that you will attend to their needs, be with those who are helping them to recover. Bless them, bless their family, Father. Father, we are thankful for the lesson that we heard today. We pray, Father, that you will give us humility and that we will strive to serve one another we pray, Father, that you will look down upon us as your children, that you will bless us, help us to continually do those things that are right. Forgive us when we fail you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, uh, some other people that we need to continually remember in our prayers, Utana Phillips, Flo Jones. Joan Sherry Wakeland, Gerald Bean, Ava Tucker, Jimmy Stinson, Tammy Rudd, Misty Campbell, and Lana Phillips. We uh, hope that you will remember each and every one of these daily in your prayers. Uh, some uh, general announcements now. For many years, the Benton Congregation has supported the Southwestern Christian College uh, through an annual fundraiser, and this is a predominantly black college in Terrell, Texas uh, that trains preachers to go out into the black communities and preach in black churches. If you would like to contribute to this good work, we'd ask you to give your donation to Bill Morgan. Bill has kind of spearheaded this, uh, this work for many, many years. And uh, so if you'd like to donate to this, uh, give it to Bill or one of the elders will be fine and we'd like to if you would uh, have this donation by next Sunday. So keep that in mind. Uh, volunteers are needed for the after school program. If you're interested in helping with that good work, uh, need to uh, check with somebody in the office and uh, they'll be glad to direct you to uh, that good work. Uh, daylight saving time begin next Sunday, March the 11th. Don't forget to run your clocks forward uh, one hour. That's especially for you, Billy Borland. One hour forward. <laughs> You'll get me. Uh, we have several events coming up. Check the bulletin board, please. One announcement about uh, the Youth Christian Chronicle has an article in the March issue about uh, the recent shooting 
at Marsh County High School, and it is featuring our own Pamela Ross, one of the youth group here at Benton. If you would like to receive this publication at no charge, there's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board, or you can go online, Christian Chronicle. So we're glad they're featuring Pamela. We would like to thank everyone for attending the Sunday night uh, churchwide potluck and singing last Sunday night. We had great attendance. We're going to do this four times this year, once each quarter. So make plans to attend. We had a good meal. We had good attendance. We had good fellowship. A uh, reminder that the president of Freed Hardeman University, David Shannon, will be with us on Sunday night, March 18th. That's this month, Sunday night, March 18th. Uh, please be making plans to attend that and also our gospel meeting May the 6th through 9th with John Dale. John has been a uh, great friend of this congregation for many, many years and so let's make plans to come and hear him. In the foyer you will find a book rack from Apologetics Press. That uh, material is free for your taking. It is material for young folks through adults. So take a look at that. If there's anything you'd like on that uh, book rack, pick it up, take it home. It'd be a great, there's a lot of great material out there. I looked at it a few minutes ago. All right. Uh, I believe that's all the announcements I have. Uh, we have uh, Bible classes to follow, and we have a lot of good classes. A lot of people who have studied to teach these classes. If you're visiting with us, please let us direct you to one of those classes. And regular members, please attend those classes. If there's nothing else, we are dismissed to class. <laughs>